Popcorn being made out in the corridor, so. You're live. Oh, yeah. So, are you people online okay? Should <laughs> <laughs> you come over here? Uh, I'll just do a quick introduction. Um, I want to remind everybody welcome to Earth Week. Um, we started off yesterday, we have a whole bunch of other activities uh, planned. The canoe trip this afternoon, which is full, so if you want to go next year, be sure to sign up early. Um, and. We have coming up tomorrow, Dr. Hood will do his bat walk in the evening. We are partnering with uh, Keep Louisiana Beautiful with Love the Boot, which is a cleanup event around campus. That'll be at 5 o'clock um, at the Horseshoe, 7 o'clock in Audubon Park with Dr. Hood talking about our local bats and the ecology. And then on Thursday, we have a round table, and that'll be during the window. It's our year-long roundtable theme of looking at um, energy resilience, green energy, and transferring over to more sustainable uh, energy sources. And this week, I think no, you're leading that. It's about ESG, the oh, environment, okay. social, and governance. We have two speakers. One of them is taking it from the perspective of the environment, and the other one is taking it from the perspective of the environment, and the other one is taking it from so definitely everything to do with that topic, and they're, they're just going to present it on a very basic level, and have, we'll have lots of great discussions, so looking forward to that. Cool. The only reason I know about ESGs is because a student, an Emma student, did a capstone project with me on ESGs two years ago, I think, two, yeah. Um, so Emil schubert Tavalera, and so I knew nothing about it. He did this great research project on it. And so it's pretty interesting, so I'll be interested in here where it's, where it's gone now in oh, that yeah. two years. And it's in the news, like, all the time. Right, yeah. yeah. Really yeah. important to know. Um, so that's Thursday during the window, and then uh, May Thomas is doing insect lighting, insect uh, black lighting at 7.30 after sundown right here in Peace Squad, right? Mm -hmm. Over there, yep. Peace Squad, <laughs> yep. on Thursday. She'll have uh, Zach, the Energizer Bunny from the Insectarium. Is like a whiz on insects and super awesome to interact with. So, um, and all these are free, by the way. So please feel free to and open to everybody, um, the whole New Orleans community. And then Friday we have our big gathering up on the roof of the building. Uh, we'll have the greenhouse open. We'll have some Loyola bands playing on the deck outside of the greenhouse. We call it the greenhouse gathering. And we'll also have a sustainability fair out in the quad. So that all starts at. Four o'clock down on the um, sorry on Palm Court, and then five o'clock up on the greenhouse. And then once sun sets, we'll have physics bring out some telescopes. The bad thing is, it looks like it's going to rain. Oh, no. So we do have an alternative plan in the data center. So just keep an eye out if you're going to go to check that out. I think we'll still have the greenhouse open as well. So um, with all that, I hope you can attend some of those um, and. I just want to quickly introduce Jaime. He graduated in 2021. He got two degrees, two and a half degrees. He got an EVA <coughs> degree yeah, something like that. in social uh, sciences. He got a journalism degree. And because that wasn't enough, he also got a minor in biology. <laughs> um, and I think he didn't feel he did enough, so he was also the president of this fraternity. And I think he fulfilled a number of roles there. Um, you're also part of the Maru as well. So you did Maru Minutes and a whole bunch of other stuff with that. He was also part of an integral part of our Earth Day festivities um, in 2021. He kind of was the host and MC of our Earth Day greenhouse gathering um, that is live streamed. So he did a lot. And on top of that, it wasn't all. He also won the EMBA Award. The faculty voted him as the most deserving student for service to the environment program. And that wasn't quite enough, so 
<laughs> he also won the top honor for graduating seniors of the university on the university level. He won the Ignatian Award. Ooh, thank you. So, um, I didn't do it by myself. I had a lot of people <laughs> helping me at the end, and the middle, and the beginning. Yeah. So um, no surprise, he's gone on to do some awesome stuff, which he's going to talk about today. And this actually isn't. He's, he's getting a master's. He's about to finish his master's at Tulane Public Health. Um, this is a side project that he's been doing. So uh, he sure recently he... ran a half marathon. Oh, <laughs> yeah. See, and I know he did a bicycling trip. Uh, 4,000 mile trip across the southern U.S. Uh, that one I didn't cycle. The other oh, one I did. Yeah. Uh, that, that sounds like a great project. So, I'm um, exhausted. I know, <laughs> me too. Um, so there's some sugar over here. <laughs> some cupcake. Uh, join me in welcoming Jaime back to Loyola. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. All right, thank you everyone for coming out. Uh, today I'll be talking a little bit about health in the apartheid state and we're going to be looking at the intersections of planning, policy, and health in New Orleans. Ooh. This one? This one? This one. Um, but I think it's fitting and appropriate that we start this Earth Week, or this event in Earth Week, with a little land acknowledgement. And I ask everyone to just take a deep breath, ground yourself in where you are physically, mentally, um, and I'll go ahead and start. So this presentation is being hosted from land originally inhabited and traversed by over 40 native tribes who called it by the Choctaw name Obansha, a place of many tongues. I want to recognize the people who came before us and continue to call Obansha home. The federally recognized Chittimacha tribe, Kishada tribe, the Gina Band of Choctaw Indians, the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana, as well as the state recognized Adi'i Caddo tribe, the Biloxi Chittimacha Confederation, the Choctaw Apache community, Clifton Choctaw, Four Winds tribe, Grand Caillou du Lac Band, Ile de Jean Charles Band, Louisiana Choctaw Tribe, Point Shen Indian Tribe, and the United Homan Nations, as well as the Atacapa Ishak Nation of Louisiana. And here I'm highlighting uh, two women right here. Uh, these are Chinamacha Indians from uh, named Ernestine Wallace and Lydia Darden. And here we have a cypress tree, and here a little kind of blurry, but those are palmettos. So what they're doing is basket we weaving. And um, many tribes and people down in the Lafouche and Terrebonne Parish still practice a lot of basket weaving. So being able to connect and uh, that there are still Native Indigenous groups here, they're still living, um, instead of having the context of that's something that happened so long ago, it's, no, it's continuous and we are uh, continuing to build off of uh, generations of knowledge and land that they um, cared for before us. So a quick little objective and outline. So uh, the presentation will explore the fields of public health and planning and use that intersection to look at the health disparities in New Orleans. And overall, what I'll be doing is bringing out a public health issue, connecting that to a policy, and then connecting that into a health outcome from it. A little outline, we have my time at Loyola, my life now, a quick little terminology, uh, laying the foundation, and the health issue we're looking at today is racism. The policy that we'll be looking at is redlining, and the case study to sort of grapple that is the uh, Flint Goodrich Hospital. And then we'll look at present health disparities and health outcomes, and at the end we'll connect the dots and do a little reflection. So, a little bit about my time at Loyola, I was uh, a double major, so this one sort of highlights my uh, School of Communication Design background. So, me uh, on the anchor desk, I was also a crew leader, uh, part of an organization here at Loyola called Phi Kappa Phi, and I believe they're having a philanthropy week, so if you see them, uh, please uh, support uh, our philanthropy, and the mission of our philanthropy is to raise funds and aware awareness for people with disabilities. Um, I was a writer for the Maroon, as well as a assistant director and um, diversity and inclusion officer for the Sean and Donnelly Center. Um, my other half at Loyola was sort of in the environment program. So here is a picture of my capstone that myself and Mark and Professor Kathy Anselmo sort of allowed me to do on her property. And it was a forest revitalization effort. Um, that's me and my cap and gown. And through my experience, I was able to bike across Florida. But that's when the pandemic hit. 
So I ended up biking over 600 miles from my living room. Um, and at the very top, two years ago, around this time, I was, had the ability to bridge both my communication and my environment sort of passions into producing and helping produce the environment show. So I ensured that, or tried to get the journalists to look at stories from an environment lens, but also to try to empower uh, members of the environment program to broadcast their knowledge in different ways. And here's a highlight of the sunset and uh, some of the bands. So where I am now. So after I graduated, I accepted a job with my organization, uh, Pi Cap Phi, as a project manager. So I was uh, one of 26, and I ensured the safety and the logistics of a 26-man cross-country uh, bike trip to spread awareness for people with disabilities. Um, after that, I enrolled as a MPA student at Tulane, so I know there's a little conflict between my, uh, my wolf pack and a little bit of the wave, but uh, from there, I had the opportunity to serve as a graduate assistant at the Office of Sustainability and a graduate assistant at the Taylor Center for Social Innovation and Design Thinking. So a little bit about what I do at the Office of Sustainability is I have worked with their sort of communication efforts. I have worked their move out. So something that they have is Trash to Treasure, which is a focus on uh, limiting waste and reducing waste. And I have sort of have been able to liaison that here at Loyola a little bit. It's getting bigger this year. I heard, I heard. And then uh, a little bit more recent, uh, last summer I had the uh, privilege of being an intern at the Kresge Foundation on their health team. And this is a little publication that I was working on. So looking at how they were understanding community health systems and conducting a request for information on building their capacity. Um, I now lead a small business survey with the Broad Community Connections nonprofit. So if you know where the Whole Foods is in Mid-City, that entire project is called the Refresh Project, and the BCC office is on the second floor. And what they focus on is building power in the community as well as property ownership. And the top two, I had the privilege of attending a United Nations General Assembly meeting in New York. Um, so I looked at the tripartite relationship between a health system, Chevron oil and gas, and, um, and the local government. So forming that triangle to really uplift the community through the public and private sector. And that's me. I ran a marathon. So whenever I'm not doing all this, I, I do enjoy running and like quiet. I love quiet. I can't get enough of it now. So we can go into sort of the crux of the presentation, or way before we get into the presentation, I want us to have somewhat of a foundation of terms that I'll use that you may or may not be in, uh, familiar with. And throughout each term, as soon as I get it, if you've heard of it, I'd like to you all to raise your hands. If you haven't heard of it, don't put it down. Just so I get an idea of who's in the room and where we are collectively. So first term, critical consciousness. If you've heard of this, please raise your hand. If not, don't. Cool, cool. Um, so critical consciousness. So this sort of stems from digging beneath the surface of information to develop a deeper understanding of concept, relationship, and personal biases. Um, on the right, I uh, highlighted the ped ped pedagogy of the oppressed by Paolo Fieri. Um, I learned about this in a community organization class and the concepts of uh, what was happening in Brazil and how we think of education and the processes of how we educate students and the priorities of that. Um, so a little model. So we have critical awareness, which is what we think about, for example, our environment, social sustainability, our actions for change, our, what we do over time, and both of that sort of form this critical consciousness of creating sustainable communities. So this model right here was created for engineers on how they think about production and design. So apartheid, much of what we know about apartheid um, stems from what occurred as the actual event, but bringing it a little zoom out lens, we're looking at apartheid as a system. So the system of apartheid uh, refers to the implementation and maintenance of legalized racial segregation in one racial group and is deprived of political and civil rights. This word comes uh, derived from the word 
which literally translate, translates to separating or setting apart. Um, this fuels into policy that is focused on the idea of se separating people. And my title of this presentation sort of comes from a dissertation that looks at apartheid outside of the event as more of a system and how that system breaches New Orleans. Health disparity, these uh, refer to the preventable difference in the burden of disease, injury or violence, uh, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. These can be ethnicity, race, gender, education, income, disability, geographic location, or sexual orientation. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even know. forgot. Health equity, anyone heard of health equity? Cool, cool. So health equity, this is the state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain the highest level of health. Um, achieving this requires focus on ongoing societal efforts to ensure that everyone has that opportunity. Um, next one, racism. Cool, gotcha. So this is a form of prejudice that assumes the members of racial categories have distinctive characteristics and that these differences result in some racial groups being inferior to other and often leads to a different treatment, a stereotype, and in some cases, violence. violence. It's also hand in hand to how we think of discrimination on the differential treatment of different groups based on ethnic, religious, national, or, or other criteria. Uh, social determinants of health. Yes, yes. I know I became familiar with this at Loyola, so watching that. Uh, but these refer to the conditions of the environment where people are live. So in this graphic, we can break it down into the income status, the education status, the health access, and where a person is at the time of their health, the quality of care, as well as the social and community context. Um, so these aren't necessarily the, these are the conditions that someone may or may not have a choice in being in, and sets them uh, to become a disenfranchised population in terms of health. Uh, next, social vulnerability, gotcha. Uh, this is the potential negative con effects of communities caused by external stresses. So these could be by disasters or disease, um, but it also could be as simple as a lack of transportation or poverty, um, increasing the state or how vulnerable a population is because of those factors. Um, finally, we have zoning. So zoning. So this is sort of, this is a planning uh, for how we create the built environment based on policy. Um, so this is dividing land that comp comprises the statutory area of a local authority into sections. So what can be built on where and what is the purpose of this land? So through those definitions, uh, the foundation that I'm laying as a public health um, concern is racism. So on the right, you see two photos of some protests occurring. So nationally, the American Public Health Association released these statements as racism as a public health crisis of 2021. Uh, what was part of the catalyst was the murder of George Floyd and civil unrest that occurred um, that really pointed out there was a lot of discrepancies in the name of racism. Uh, one being is how we treat uh, different people in the health system and sphere. So a practice that I want to highlight that is the policy of sort of a racist lens is redlining. So this is a discriminatory practice that consists of systemic, systematic denial of services such as mortgages, insurance loans, and other financial services to residents of a certain area based on race. So this practice came out of the 1920s and 1930s. Um, and during the New Deal era, era government insured mortgages were established from home own owners as a form of support for the economy. However, the government only limited certain loans depending on maps that were drawn up based on the value of property. So these color-coded maps uh, represented how worthy a loan was in certain neighborhoods in the United States. And there were four categories, and most of the neighborhoods marked in red, which is the worst category, 
were predominantly inhabited by black residents. And the consequence of this were black residents were denied these government-insured loans, which leans itself into uh, not being able to generate wealth, as well as homes, and something that you could pass down um, to future generations. Um, here we have, uh, on the left, is what a redlining map looked like for New Orleans. And here on the right, we have the Social Vulnerability Index of the CDC. Um, I know it's a lot, we got a lot of sort of spaghetti noodles in the middle, but something that I want to draw your attention to at this point in the presentation is the map on the left. So on the top right, we have green, blue, yellow, and red. So the, the, these are the four grades uh, that the homeowners loan corporation during the 1930s graded neighborhoods. So the A scale, the green, were deemed quote, best. Uh, the blue scale, blue, were, quote, still desirable. The yellow C neighborhoods were definitely declining, and the D neighborhoods were considered hazardous. So lower grades made it harder for applications to secure mortgages to purchase homes or even improve their homes. In those neighborhoods, uh, purchase homes in those neighborhoods. Um, and the color sort of uh, schematic is akin to how we think of traffic lights. Green signaled lenders when making decisions to approve. Yellow was to exercise caution. And red was to think twice and stop. So um, taking some time to sort of digest that. And has anyone ever seen a red line map of New Orleans? No. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Well, what, why are some of the neighborhoods the white? They just they weren't graded? Because that looks like it's French Quarter area. Uh, and CBD maybe? Correct. This is, they were not in the map of 19th. So they were not. Um, and I'm alluding to this sort of slide. I'll allude to this slide later on, but I want you to just keep into contacts of which ones are red and which ones are blue and green, and maybe you can detect where Loyola is kind of. Something like that? No, no, no. We're. Yeah! No, you're right. Yeah, yeah. You're right. Oh, gotcha. So. Keeping this in mind, we'll sort of enter our sort of case study phase. And let me check time real fast. So Flint Goodrich Hospital. Has anyone ever heard of Flint Goodrich Hospital? Cool. We have a couple in the, couple in the room. Um, so Flint Goodrich Hospital, uh, the doors of Flint, previously known at, or originally known as Flint Medical College, opened in 1896. Uh, this, is, this photo right here is the dedication ceremony. Um, later in 1932 when they moved locations, but this hospital was founded as a sanitarium and a nursing school, and it would be the institution to foster black medical professions in New Orleans and much of the Gulf South. So after the doors closed in 1911, they built a center in downtown New Orleans on Canal and Robertson Street, current zip code 70113, if you're oriented like that, and it was converted to a 50-bed hospital in 1916, and it would serve the black community in New Orleans for decades. However, due to Jim Crow, it was the only private hospital in the city at the time that would make it uh, where black patients could be under the care of black physicians. And a little bit to highlight the strengths of this institution. Um, one, it was an institution uh, to foster a lot of uh, new doctors, primarily black and physicians, doctors, nurses, um, and they did that through providing residencies. Um, at the time, it was very limited to uh, where you could get a residency in New Orleans based on race, um, as well as the facility privileges and how there was a difference in where you could get a residency and the services and equipment you had access to. Um, additionally, community center. A lot of the practice at Flint Goodridge prioritized um, what we now know is like whole community care, being able to care, care for the whole person in a sense. Um, there's also the factor of being cared for without the fear of discrimination based on race. And we see this uh, have a lot of health implications today uh, about where the medical field is and how there is a knowledge discrepancy on how practices are administered based on race. 
Um, also, it was the largest black employer in the state with 350 affiliated positions and 220 full-time workers. Um, so, a little bit about their time, or the timeline. So, uh, the hospital existed and was doing successfully. Um, however, in the mid-1950s, we see a shift. So, this institution was previously a Jim Crow institution. However, when the desegregation occurred, a lot of the dynamics and sort of income generators were separated and changed. So, um, 1954, we have the Brown v. Board of Education um, Act, and in 1965, following year, we see the ending of colored wards, so separation for patients based on race. Um, and I will note, um, Uh, in 1967, uh, one of the consultants that were debating on what, uh, that had concerns early on about what desegregation would do for this institution, quoted, um, the extent of desegregation will determine the future of success of this hospital. And to provide some clarification is that when desegregation occurred, um, white physicians um, started limiting where they could practice and what patients they were coming in. So instead of using Flint Goodridge as a source to bring in patients, they sort of separated them, or slowly uh, left Flint Goodridge and went to other hospitals because they no longer had to be in that institution. And in 1968, we see this wave of a temporary increase due to a, a little endemic that was happening in New Orleans, and that provided an opportunity for Flint Goodridge to think about, well, maybe we can expand this hospital. Um, in 1969, there was a proposal for adding 150 inpatient beds, a health clinic, a child care center, an education center, 160 beds for long-term care, and a separate desire project and lower night, in the desire project and lower night work clinics. Um, so going back to this idea of community and care, what Flint Goodridge at the time was an early public health powerhouse, um, because not only were they concerned about care at the end or high acute care whenever you need to go to a hospital, they were looking and understanding that being able to provide health services in different locations, in different parts of the cities, in different age demographics uh, would provide healthier people. Um, so with this proposal in 1969, it was pitched to the city um, and it would fall under the Model Cities program. Um, this program would have offered funding for expansion, um, an opportunity and yes, however, the plan was not approved, and the New Orleans Housing Authority um, refused to sell more property due to zoning. So instead of this hospital uh, being able to expand, a pivot was, okay, well, what if we buy property near us or allocate something around us in the similar area? They weren't able to do that, so limiting which directions they could based on how zoning um, afforded downtown New Orleans. So at a little sort of health kind of baseline um, or highlight is in, 1960, in 1970, the mortality rate for African Americans was 10.06 per 1,000, which nearly equaled for whites 9.15. Um, and highlight again, the hospital had spearhead in many of their public health initiatives responsible for this improvement. So what made this institution um, continue to gather up of the black population was its affordability, how it administered insurance plans, as well as, uh, yes. So between the 1963 and 1969, um, we see the steady decline of patients and the hospital no longer having patients, no longer having insurance money or uh, generating income. So it slowly became underfunded um, and severely underfunded to the point of closure. Um, so six years, uh, after six years of this sort of period, uh, the medical school, school no longer uh, teach practice, um, and a big worry was that once the certification to call uh, students who enter Flint Ridge a physician after they exited, um, there was a tremendous decline on the how much effort was inputted um, because it was started as a medical school, um, and once that sort of certi certification processes um, declined, it was severely undervalued. Um, and in 1950, 1985, we see the hospital close 
Um, and many of the patients in Fleet Vicarage were transferred to Charity Hospital, which at the time comprised 75% um, of African Americans. Uh, also something I want to point out, um, when Flint Grid Ridge was closed in 1985, um, from severely underfunding, th there was that transfer. And by 2000, um, African, or, sorry, the mass majority of charities, 100,000 patients annually earn less than 20,000 a year, and over half had no medical insurance. So the population at charity was also mirroring what was happening at Flint Goodrich. The severe underfunding would happen, as well as the insurance and patient numbers um, being sort of the indicators. Other all hospitals in the city average only 4% of their patients with, without insurance and combined serve 17% of the uncompensated cases compared with the 83% provided by charity. And in August 2005, the failure of the levees during the Hurricane Katrina led to the inundation of the charity hospital and it never reopened. So thinking about sort of a general timeline and how we can sort of fit in a more modern day event, there, an, a giant health institution had to transfer to another health institution and then that health institu institution never recovered because of Hurricane Katrina. So we think about what happened to those patients, what happened to those files, what happened to the legacy of black physicians and doctors and wealth opportunities that could have been built. And here on the right, we have a fundraising campaign uh, for Flint Goodridge at the time. It dates, uh, yes, yes, I'll it there. Um, so I know that was kind of a lot, so I'll take, allow us to have a little breather. But a question that I'm pitching to the audience, and I think it'll um, allow us to sort of think more imaginatively of a historic event, but what do you think a predominantly black serving medical institution would look like if it was still in New Orleans today? Um, questions, comments, concerns? And it could still be in downtown New Orleans, or would it be in a different area of New Orleans? How big would it be? And what types of services do you think that it should have? Any? Yes? My thought immediately, unfortunately, is that it would likely be underfunded as well, mm -hmm. even though it's, it's been so long. Um, that's still the world that we live in, even in New Orleans. Thank you. Yes? So I, my uh, impression would be that it would be sort of like the HBCUs mm -hmm. and how, like, you know, it would, it would have to be based around education, I think, because, you know, we we have, like, a college ability of uh, educational facilities that are mm -hmm. for minorities, but not so much for employers that mm -hmm. discriminate based on race. So I don't know if that factors into it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? I think by this time they would also have branched out into um, other parts of New Orleans, especially like in the Lower North Ward and um, the East. So I think it would have, and forgive me because I didn't, I came in late. I'm pretty sure everyone saw me walk in here. Um, <laughs> that's fine, so, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> thank you. But I think that it would have come out and then maybe migrated over to kind of closer to Holly Grove almost and then maybe stopped at the Jefferson Parish line. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Well, these institutions aren't imaginary. They do exist. So one example is Meharry Medical College. So located in Nashville, uh, this college is the nation's oldest and largest historically black academic health science center. So hitting on that academic portion. Um, and it's dedicated to educating physicians, dentists, researchers and health policy experts. So timeline is kind of similar. Founded in 1876 and then was chartered separately in 1915. Um, and this college is a United Methodist affiliate. And in 2010, it was published in the uh, 
and published and ranked uh, as one of the nation's top five producers of primary care physicians. Um, it's also a leading producer of African Americans with PhDs in biomedical sciences. So I, I wanted to sort of contrast um, all that to sort of begin this transition into thinking into the future and where we as wherever fields we come from, environment, biology, um, social sciences, um, art, literature, planning, design, um, into thinking how we all can have an input and a foot in creating healthy outcomes for other people. So to bring us into present, um, the New Orleans Health Department releases a report and specified or uh, centered it on health disparities in New Orleans. Um, the report was published in 2013 and the sources used were sort of the United States Census um, as well as other national uh, census tracking uh, tools. So uh, African Americans were eight times more likely to die of homicide than whites in Orleans Parish during um, the survey period or the census collection, um, as well as three times more likely to die of diabetes and twice as likely to die of kidney disease and HIV. So we have this sort of contrast of communicable disease and something that is outside the realm of uh, infection or disease. Cool. Uh, this is a cool image, and I want you to sort of keep in mind how you saw the redlining map and how you see here. And this spot is where Flint Goodridge Hospital would have been. Um, and this is, if anyone's familiar with downtown uh, New Orleans, where like Joy Theater is, this is that sort of part. So, 70112. This contains the Tulane, Gravier, Iberville, and Tremaine neighborhoods. Life expectancy, and this is coming from the information in 2013, uh, 54.5. Uh, this er these areas have the highest rate of STDs, low birth weight, and heart disease of any zip code in the city. And it has the highest percentage of people living 150% of the federal or below the federal poverty line in New Orleans as a whole. Um, and we can contrast that to the zip code 70124, which encompasses Lakeshore, Lake Vista, Lakeview, West End, Lakewood, and the Bar neighborhoods. Life expectancy here is 80. Um, this, these areas have the lowest rate of STDs and low birth weight, and the second lowest for heart disease rate of zip codes in New Orleans. It also has the lowest percentage of people living below 150% of the federal poverty level in New Orleans. So thinking about how we sort of presented social determinants of health early on. Income uh, in, is encompassed in the social determinants of health, but also how we view social vulnerability. Um, so that's over a 10 year period that the survey was done? Instead it's based on census data. data, so 2010 data, and then from 2010 okay. they took time and it produced a report 2013. Okay. So we go back to this slide right here. We have our red line district map and now I get to talk a little bit of what you see on the right. So what you see on the right is uh, the social vulnerability index that the CDC produces in the event of how, or how they uh, provide resources uh, for events of disaster, and they base this on the four metrics of being able to, uh, for transportation, um, income, a uh, few others. Um, but what we see is that how socially vulnerable you are is the reddish colors, and how, or not as socially vulnerable we see it in the green colors. So you could sort of track the sort of green a little bit, but you could definitely track the red, and how there is an influence on where the red line maps were and how vulner socially vulnerable these populations continue to be. And this information uh, is updated within 2020, because that's where that, this census data came from. So keeping that in mind, um, and as we move forward, uh, so before I sort of <laughs> begin to our closing and transition to the end of this presentation, any any thoughts? Um, yes. Yeah, um, um, that's fascinating to see. I've, I've never seen this match before, but um, I believe that red on the image on the right, isn't that the interstate? 
And then it goes, so that's I-10, where it curves six, no, I mean I-10 goes into downtown and then curves out. Mm -hmm. uh, the expressway? The expressway, yeah. So, you, yeah, mm, I mean, I'm pretty a, sure that that's because I'm trying to follow where mm, Claiborne is and yeah. then north of there, and all that red right there seems to be surrounding mm. the Claiborne. Oh, that's a whole pass. different presentation, uh, but no, I, can, yeah. I can go, that'll be part two. This will be, this will be my series <laughs> opener. Be um, any other thoughts? If you even go to Lakeview, you can tell, like, oh, these people rich. Like, you know, like, yeah, it's like if you look at the houses and, um, like, just the, like, the, they even sound rich, like Lakeview, Lake Villa, like, like they don't sound So, I thought that was interesting. Thank you. And one more? Yes. No, I'm not thinking about, um, I know Baker just announced that they're about to open a medical school, mm -hmm. and a part of the conversation is where to put it um, and what community to serve. So, mm -hmm. that's just what I was thinking of. Ooh, that's a that's a perfect segue into sort of the end, or getting closer to the end, um, and it's presenting sort of a model. So, in the context of planning um, and policy, I think that being able to base decisions like that on models like this will be very very beneficial. So, uh, the sort of three models that I'll or discuss a little bit is a public health critical race practices the design justice practice, and critical race theory. And critical race theory is embedded in each um, as sort of a foundation, and the two models are intertwined by the decisions. Uh, for example, uh, part of the public health critical race practice um, is understanding the positions of groups in the racial hierarchy. And for a design justice principle that sort of is embedded in that is centering the voices of those directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. So we understand that there are implications when we try to produce public health initiatives or programs without talking to our stakeholders, engaging our community. Um, but the design justice, this model is sort of stem from planners and architects. Public health models sort of stem from public health practitioners, community health workers, and the critical race theory that's sort of embedded in academia and curriculum. So we have three different factors and three different sectors going in, um, but it shows how important it is to bring everyone to the table when we make these decisions, because every single decision through these models has health, health implications and goes back to really getting to health equity and addressing health disparity. So a little bit of my personal reflection and how I came into this space and journey. Um, uh, so this stemmed from an independent study, and my independent study professor, Chris Demerick, is in the audience. Thank you. Uh, but this came from a master's dissertation that really laid the bones, um, not even the backbone, just like a skeleton of how we can look at health in the apartheid state. Um, funny enough, Dr. Kevin McQueenie was a professor at Loyola a couple years back and he produced this dissertation, um, and he defended it, and that was sort of where I got this idea of like, okay, public health and the built environment definitely have a relationship, but thinking of the environment more as structure versus natural was something that I wasn't very familiar with. Um, but I wanted to highlight that my time at Loyola, the communication skills that I had, being able to talk to people and converse with them and ask critical questions on getting to the end of, getting to stories, major skill. From my environment side, being able to understand, like, I, I was the social science concentration to the max because I wanted to know how the environment and people related. I wanted to know what the decisions policymakers were having that would impact um, the environment itself, but as well as the people who lived in those environments. So whenever I was asked to do this presentation, I wanted to sort of lay this framework of going back, here's a public health issue, here's how we look at it from a policy lens, how this policy related to the health implications and sort of ended off with not, oh, I learned all this information, now what? But encouraging everyone to think about where they are, what models they've seen in class, or where they, discipline that they have to think about what decisions I can make to decrease um, health disparity and increase health equity. I think everyone has a role in it and being able to figure out where it is, um, 
I had a journalism, environmental studies, and biology background, and now I'm a budding public health professor um, because of all those things, and they directly correlated me to this path. And here's a book list. Um, I think if anyone who, if, if anyone's interested in this work or um, they don't even know if they're interested in this work, here are some of the pieces of literature that I've come across. Um, the Unthinkable, so I didn't mention, but I also am uh, getting a certificate in disaster management and resilience for Tulane. Um, and this is what assigned in a disaster communications class. Who survives when disaster strikes? Uh, Madam C.J. Walker's Gospel Giving. When I was an intern at the Kresge Foundation, this sort of laid the framework of how we think about philanthropy and who are the philanthropists and who can have the spaces to build and give. Um, not a nation of immigrants. Uh, this text also came across when I was at an intern, but it got me thinking critically of how we think about colonialism, white supremacy, and the history of it, erasure. Uh, Development, Drown, and Reborn. This text was a text um, I used during my previous survey and experience with uh, broad community connections, and it got me thinking about New Orleans. So if you think you know New Orleans, I suggest that one. And the last one is Franchise, uh, The Golden Arches in Black America, How We See Black Capitalism. Um, all books are highly suggest, um, especially if you're trying to get into the spaces and where to start. Um, and being able to read books is a big skill. I did not understand that until way into grad school. And we have to question, like, where are we getting our sources? Where are we getting our knowledge, and how can we generate more and produce this? And just want to say thank you all. Um, uh, this is my LinkedIn, and here's a, my email address if you need anything. Uh, it's not a school email, so this is my professional, personal email. And would love to connect with everyone. If you need it, I'm here to be an advocate and accomplice for y'all because there is a lot of good that we can that you you have right now as a student in um, the Inva program or whatever program you're in, um, and I challenge you to think about how you can amplify that to um, like building lasting change. Okay. So that is that's my presentation. I think there's maybe a minute or two of, for questions, but if not, plenty of uh, there's plenty of cupcakes. Yes, how you doing, Doctor? Good to see you, man, and thanks for coming. And that was awesome. um, so, in this journey that you've taken, have you come across folks that are seeing this from an outside perspective of the United States? And I'm trying to get to the fact that we see medical community and medical professions outside of America as being what we negatively call socialized medicine. Right? Mm -hmm. At least that's what I've heard from doctors and nurses and everything else. Yes. Right? But then you meet people from those countries and they really believe in the medical care. Mm -hmm. And they really believe in the equity and inclusion associated with it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you've come across any of that and in terms of looking at health care and equity and that. Have you, have you considered it or seen it or experienced it or any of that? So the one of the big debates that I've had with healthcare and in the sphere is that we pull a lot of our models from a lot of different places. So not having one system the whole way around makes it hard to advocate for something that a, I think makes it harder to advocate for something that a country has when they have it just one system. Um, the fact that we're pulling from private, public, uh, federal, uh, systems, I think it, it makes it harder, but I think prioritizing people's care and what they know about their bodies is a big discussion that sort of lends itself. Other countries do that better, and we have room to grow, I think, but that also stems from not having institutions and academic spheres that we can explore um, different ways we look at health for different people. background, do you see this like at home or did you see it growing up at all or even now? I, what I 
Yes. <laughs> um, I think there was a lot of blinders that were re revealed whenever I got to be in the space of higher ed. When I got to do an undergrad and a graduate program because access to literature skyrocketed. And some cool stuff and tools that I found is that I did relate this. I'm from Houston, Texas, um, H-Town all the way. But I looked at specifically how environmental racism played in my backyard and how that created health implications. Because the same way I looked at neighborhoods through a red line map, I looked at neighborhoods of environmental injustices, like which neighborhoods in Houston were where landfills or were practices that moved and broke up communities were. And I think that's like having to digest like, well, this is not theory. This is, these are real life examples. Here are where I learned them from. And here's the conditions that led up to it. I think that's sort of transition whenever I, it's like, oh yeah, this is, this is poor people like me. <laughs> Yes. So what sort of percentage or role, um, level of role do you see governments versus non-government uh, agencies playing in kind of correcting these systemic issues? Mm -hmm. I think talking about systemic, we have to have government play a role. Um, whether that role is to put a foot in or take a foot out is where community can sort of center themselves. But I think empowering local community, their local health department, and then escalating up is where we can get to that systematic change. But I think there's still a, on the individual and the close, smallest concentric circle we are, there's still a gap of understanding how health is played out. And then like, we can either go very small to big or very big to small, but we have, I don't see them an agreed dimension on that nationally. You can see it locally with how community health workers are administered or where community health clinics are um, because there's a understanding that this community needs something for their specific <coughs> needs but providing funds and I think leveraging the private sector could be a, a use of time that happens simultaneously as a leveraging the public sector. Um, sort of that's sort of what I learned a little bit at the UN um, General Assembly is that bringing in partners and having stakeholders who um, have the financial capital to leverage uh, social capital. Yes. Yeah, you mentioned you had read for uh, Presby Foundation a book about Madam C.J. Walker mm -hmm. and her philanthropic approach. Could you talk a little bit about who she was and what that approach was and how knowing about it um, interacts with your experience in philanthropy. So, Matt C.J. Walker was a seamstress uh, by trade, and what she did was seamstress and then hair, and slowly uh, clients would come in and she would soon accumulate a lot of wealth from um, what she learned and what she did for her entire life. Um, what this book really highlighted is the idea of philanthropy and who can be a philanthropist. Um, a lot of what we see, so uh, where I worked at Kresge Foundation, um, Kresge, uh, you know Kmart, so that was at Kresge. Um, after uh, late 30s, they sort of separated, and then, but that investment still pulled, but it was a good contrast thinking about how we see philanthropy, and we think about other big foundations, so Ford Foundation, Kellogg, like they accumulated all this money and then get to decide we get to give it this year to this much based on this grant application and you're going to follow these five six indicators and you're going to measure this through this and then you're going to submit a report um, and then we get to give you more money but i think this book really highlighted the idea of community and being able to leverage uh, mutual aid as a way of being philanthropic um, and a funny or an addition is that after my internship, I was uh, given a consultant role. So I've been doing consultant work for Kresge this entire year. And my project is looking how they view their focus areas and 
find gaps in that analysis so they can give better. So sort of that directly relates to how Madam C.J. Walker is idea of like being able to give better and allow yourself to be a giver. Thank <laughs> you.